and I would love to invite Michelle Gordon from Gordon IP um, to, and to chat about understanding your IP and how to protect your IP assets as well. Round of applause, please. small up here but I'm looking taller. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was great to be here and I know it's a, a legal subject but it's not boring at all because I'm really passionate about it um, because it affects every single person in this room and I think more businesses should know about it so um, I hope I can part my knowledge on you today with uh, learning about the different types. Just... Um, I've been an intellectual property lawyer for 20 years and I've seen it all. I've seen people do all sorts of things and uh, hope I can impart some of my knowledge um, from all those experiences with dealing different, with different businesses. Um, I also uh, deal with startups on a daily basis, young businesses, and I really love that because I get a chance to show you and to grow and to see, you know, to protect your IP so that going forward you can feel confident and strong in your business. I love hearing about people's ideas. They come into my office and they've got great ideas and I really, really, really hope that they do well and excel going forward and, um, and I help, you know, protect those ideas along the way. But it's, you know, you, you think, I've had bis businesses that have come in and, you know, singlet, shorts, you know, and um, ten years down the track I'm still working with them and they've become, you know, being on the rich list, for example, you know, it's one of those things where you just don't know how the idea is going to go, but we'll, we walk with them along the way to get to the right place. Um, it's, it's an important part of your business. Um, as I said, it affects every single business that comes through my door, um, and you need to um, be aware of what your assets are. So what is intellectual property? Well, it refers to the creations of the mind, which is also fantastic. Getting those uh, ideas from your head um, onto paper or onto, into action and actually how to protect those ideas from someone else coming along and taking your, your ideas and running with them, which is what people do these days. They don't come up with uh, their own ideas. They like to copy people and, and it happens every single day and people don't realise how often it happens, but it does. Um, considering that the internet is getting, um, making the world become smaller by you know, having so many businesses on the internet. Um, we're going to go through these um, four types of intellectual property um, today. There are more, but these are the ones that are going to, um, ones that you'll remember and, and look out for. So patents. Um, a patent is an invention. It's a, the type of invention can be a device, a substance, a method or a process. Um, and to have a patent, you must have something that's new, something that's useful, something that's inventive or innovative. There are types of different types of patterns and often when people come through the front door I tend to stick to the one, um, one type of pattern that I recommend and that's what's called a provisional pattern. Now a provisional pattern is um, a place card holder basically where you get a, a filing date and that's in the IP world, filing dates are the, the most important and it allows you to develop the idea over a 12 month period. Now normally if you file a standard pattern um, the uh, patent has to be correct when you file it um, and you, uh, uh, you can't make many changes. Whereas a provisional pattern, they come in and they go, right, well, I've got this great idea. Um, I'm still working on it. You know, I'll have to do this and I'll have to do that. I'm going to get some, I think I'm going to get some money throughout the year. I'm going to, um, you know, do some research and development. Um, and that, that's what generally happens, you know, that they, they try to change things. They go, right, well, I've created it. I've put all the nuts and bolts together but I think I can, I think I can make it better. And that, that provisional pattern allows um, the uh, applicant to change it. Um, the only uh, issue is, is at the end of the 12 months, well, it's not an issue, you can, you can change the, what's called claims of the pattern. And you, because a, a patent attorney meticulously goes through what you're uh, offering, and they try to um, you know, sift out all the bits that you want to protect, so it's very, um, got to be very precise. But with this provisional patent, we can change it at the end of the 12 months, which is um, a good thing. Um, what a pat I guess what a patent will do is will give you a, a monopoly over your invention. Um, and that monopoly usually lasts for 20 years. 
and it allows you to um, be able to sell, um, exclusively sell that product um, and uh, to prevent third parties from doing, selling what you've um, created. And um, it also means you can license out the idea if you have a particular product that you go, right, well, someone else is interested in mine, maybe someone else you know, in Australia that wants to produce it or can produce it faster, for example, you can actually license the idea out to third parties. Now, you can file a standard patent. Um, now, a standard patent is basically um, just filing a patent where you're sure that you know what you've got and you know that you're going to um, use it in the marketplace and you've got all everything together. Um, that standard patent you can file anywhere in the world. You can file one here, you can file one over in the States, uh, the UK, wherever you feel like you want to file it. Um, there's also what's called an international patent. Um, that international patent um, you file, you have to, uh, it gives you uh, access to 150 countries throughout the world, um, and at the end of the 36 month period, you can um, then have to convert that to the countries that you're interested in. But as you'll see in IP, it's all about knowing what's out there, it's about um, getting a filing date and getting your stamp out there that, right, I've got this file, this is the date that it was filed. And that prevents third parties from, you know, filing it before you. Um, there's some examples of, of, uh, of different patents. I mean, you've seen it: Apple iPhones, GPS, Bluetooth technology, a self-driving car, or even a type of medication. So the list is endless. What we tend to do at Gorton IP is, um, I do a free consultation. I go, right, what have you got? Show me what you've got. Um, we have a look at it. We have, we, um, I give you an invention disclosure form, and that, that just helps you list out exactly what you're going to offer. And then our patent attorney, Sean, will have a look at it and say, right, I think there's something here. I think you can file a patent, which is always exciting. <laughs> Patents are on the expensive side. I don't muck around with costs. I'm not one of those lawyers who prints out invoices, <laughs> phone invoices. I, I, I tell it straight. Um, and one of those things, patents are not cheap. That, you know, you're looking between five to seven thousand dollars for a patent, um, but you know the, you have a 20-year monopoly, so it is worth that investment. The important thing about patents is not to um, disclose the patent before you actually file something, and that's the reason why, with a, a provisional patent, that I always say, right, well, um, best if you file it um, a provisional, even though know, you're going through the, the nuts and bolts of it, and then you can change it along the way. Um, the, if you disclose a patent to someone else before you even start, well then you've got to um, make sure that that person doesn't tell anyone. Um, and what we recommend is, filing, is um, putting together a, a non-disclosure agreement um, to like, you know, manufacturers and th people that have, you have to get, you know, the information together. Um, and then um, once that's signed, um, you can start talking to them and being, um, Excuse me. <coughs> Start talking to them and, and working out, you know, what's uh, how you're going to go ahead with putting it all together. If you disclose the patent to third parties, um, what might happen is um, they'll, you know, you won't be able to file in particular countries. You know, there might be um, t Australia has a grace period of 12 months, um, and so does the US. But um, places like Europe, they don't have any d uh, grace period. So if you if you disclose then um, you might be stopping yourself from you know, getting a patent in another country. Um, I had a client who came to me and said, right, I want to file a patent. And what happened was is that um, he um, had a journalist friend. And the journalist friend, and by the way, I like to tell real life examples. I don't name names, but it's always helpful to, you know, to, to relate. Um, and that journalist friend told someone else, and then they wrote an article about it in the paper. So, the person hadn't filed a patent of any sort, had told his journalist friend, they go, oh, this is a great idea, I'm going to talk about it in a newspaper article, and therefore stopped his friend from getting a patent um, in particular countries. And it was really sad because he was really excited about it and wanted to protect it. So um, talk to an IP lawyer first. It's, we're not scary. <laughs> um, so so that's, uh, that's patents. But yeah, the, the rule of thumb there is, you know, um, if you've got something, talk to an IP lawyer, have a look at what you've got. Let's see if there's something you can protect. I always say to clients, um, even if you don't think there's something, there might be just a small amount. It doesn't have to be the full, but 
um, there might be some little bit of aspect of the invention that we can protect. So, um, and then uh, non-disclosure agreement if you're talking to third parties and don't talk to anyone else about it until, I know it sounds very secretive, but don't talk to anyone else about it before you um, have investigated or filed something. Oh, these are the top five sort of patent areas that people um, have filed. Um, you've got medical, biotech, pharma, chemistry and engineering. They're just, I'm just giving you an example of all what the different types of patents that people file. Um, the next one is designs. Um, a registered design protects the shape and ornamentation or a pattern of, of a product. Um, it's what gives the product a unique experience. Um, it must be new and distinctive and must be applied um, commercially or industrially in the marketplace. Um, having a registered design, again, stops people from using the same thing you have, even if it's a pattern and you think it's great. You know, I had, um, I have a client who uh, did a shoe and he's, he's filed it so it's, I can talk about it. Um, and he just did a part of the shoe where it's called the score zone and the child, you know, kicks the ball in that score zone. But where the circle was on the shoe, that's what he protected with a design um, registration. But it can be like a mobile phone, um, a chair, a bottle, um, car headlights, a kettle or a toy. Um, and um, as I said before, it can be uh, a, a pattern or, um, you know, the fabric with the pattern. Um, it could be the pattern on wallpaper even. If you've come up with a unique design, then that's when um, you should think about um, registering a design. I, one of my biggest clients um, is the Skins compression garments and they have the, you know, when you, you work out and they've got the pants and they've um, registered a design for the stitching on the, on the pants. Um, so that's, uh, that just shows you the, the um, different things that you can, you can uh, register. The thing with, um, with uh, designs is got a, it, there's a two-step process that most people don't know about. Um, the first one is, is that you go and register design, you get a certificate straight away. You, most people think, great, fa fa fantastic, I've got the certificate, I can go ahead and do about my business. But if you're wanting to take um, uh, action against third parties, you actually have to certify that um, design, that re design registration. Now what does that mean? It means that the examiner at the, the uh, designs office um, the government department that runs the IP and protects it um, has to examine your design to make sure there's nothing else out there that already exists. Um, and if they do that and it's all is good, um, then they'll uh, certify it. And then you can actually take, you know, if someone infringes your um, patent or, or whatever you've got, then you can actually take uh, action against them. Um, it is a, a 10 year right which cannot be renewed. Um, usually, it gets renewed every a five year point, um, but it's uh, you know it's one of those things that runs out after ten years, like a pattern with being twenty years. I'll just go back for a sec. So, one of my favourite Louis Vuitton, <laughs> um, the design on that is can be registered. Um, you know, you've got a stool by IKEA, or a, you know even an automobile there. So that's just. Um, examples of the designs. One thing is, is that, again with IP, you know, it's about taking action and go, right, I want to register it, I want to protect it. And then with designs, um, they're inexpensive. I told you, I, t I told you I'd tell you about costs. Um, they're inexpensive, um, but they can be copied quite easily, which is, which is painful. Um, so that's why I always say have a registration certificate that you can wave around and um, show someone that you've got the uh, rights to it and then they, some, you know, Hopefully, most of the time they back down, um, but uh, you know it's it's having that registration certificate and telling the world you have a registered design um, is also very helpful. Um, the other reason um, is that you know you need to be able to you know in a letter of demand you need to be able to put um, you know this is my registration I own it give an example of you you know commercialising it in the marketplace. Um, to be effective in actually taking, um, taking uh, action against third parties. Sorry. There we go. Copyright. I get lots of questions about copyright. <laughs> um, 
it's the original idea created. So put pen to paper, type something up, do a lovely picture, it's all yours. You own it. Um, there's no actual registration process in Australia. And the good news is, is that if you um, uh, put some original idea, um, that you um, are the owner of that copyright throughout the world under the countries that are part of the Berne Convention. So what can the uh, copyright protect? Well, it protects literary, literary works, computer programs, compilations, um, artistic works such as paintings, drawings, cartoons, sculptures, dramatic works, um, choreography, um, screenplays, plays, musical works, um, cine uh, sound recordings, broadcasts, and published editions. Do you have the right or the ownership of, um, of the copyright for the life of your life, <laughs> plus uh, 70 years, so it's a long time. There are some countries that do recommend that you uh, register the uh, copyright, and that's in the US, um, as it's getting harder to sort of locate the copyright owner. So they go, right, let's, um, we've got a copyright register that you can um, register your copyright. Um, and I've encouraged clients to do that. Um, and, and in China is another one. If you've got something that you, you know, if you have a um, you know, logo or something you use in China or a picture, um, it's great to be able to put, register your copyright in China because they are all about registration certificates and saying, hey, I'm the owner, here's the actual physical certificate, take a look and buck off. <laughs> um, the thing that uh, most, one of the most questions I get is about coaches or businesses that offer materials. And I think this um, applies to a lot of people because in this uh, content day and age, you are you know, preparing materials and you're handing them out. You don't want people to um, just simply just start, you know, there are free things and people give away free things, that's, that's fantastic. But there's times when people, um, you know, you have a coaching session and you don't, you don't want all your materials gone and you're online and you don't want to find out that someone that's um, paid $5,000 then started um, you know, spreading your materials around. It's heartbreaking. I've seen it happen many, many times. And they, one question they say is, well, how can I protect it? You've got your copyright in place, which is free. Um, I'm, I'm already protected that way. But then you've got to um, protect the materials. I mean, you've poured, you know, if I wrote something, I've got 20 years in IP, well, that's 20 years in, of knowledge that I'm giving someone else by giving them into my, you know, course if I did one. The way to do it is, one, is to get a, write a disclaimer or have a disclaimer on your um, material, have a copyright notice on your material. That's very important. It's all about telling people, you know, where this originated from. In the ca case of the course, um, where people pay money, um, a, a service agreement is always um, fantastic. Um, highly recommend that. Now, what is a service agreement? It's an agreement where you um, set down all the you know, bits and bobs about your business, how you're going to relate to the customer, um, and just the rules, how do you deal with each one each other, you know, how do you pay, etc. But part of that is your IP. They're recognising that you own the IP and your copyright in the, in the materials that you're, you're handing out. Um, you know, if they do use it, then you, you know, get a judge to go, right, here's the, uh, here's the agreement they signed. They, they recognise that I own the IP, so why are they handing it out? You know, stop them. <laughs> so it's always benefit, a benefit to have that. But that's how you do it with copyright. You know, you, you've got to tell the world that you're own, the owner of the copyright. Make sure in some form or another that you're telling, telling your customers or clients that, you know, don't start spreading it around. Had a client that I met with last week. They've got a fantastic training material for young men, um, and it's you know they want to uh, you know it's it's more of a charitable thing, but they do want to hand out the materials that they've spent a lot of time and money on, and um, that was the question they asked me. Um, you can have a license agreement, so you can make money out of your materials. Um, again, you can license your IP, um, and you know you might charge you know five thousand dollars for the first year, and then a yearly fee. Um, to be able to update those materials. But in that licence agreement, there's another way, um, is to make sure that you um, put, in a, put in there that you're the owner of the IP and then not to, you know, not to hand out the materials. And in fact, you know, if they don't want to continue on with the licence, that at the end, they hand back the materials to you. You can, all, you can absolutely ask that. I know they probably have it all and they've, you know, but if they don't have the physical copy, sometimes it's much harder 
Um, and if they're photocopied, well then they've already broken the agreement and um, you can take action against them. One thing that might, um, with copyright, that might affect all of you is a logo. Um, I know everyone's got a business and everyone has a logo. Um, and but I want a dollar for everyone that says, my friend helped me with this logo. Um, what happens is your friend owns the copyright in that logo. And I have had big, big businesses who've come to me and said, oops, I didn't get the copyright ownership over to me before we made a big, and um, someone's wanting to um, get some money out of us now. My message to you is always think big. Whenever you've got a business, whatever um, size it is, think big, think that you're going to make, you know, think that you're going to be in the stratosphere and make lots of money. Um, but <laughs> you've got to think of it protecting your IP now. Um, so that you've got it in, in place. But for example, with a logo, um, if you've got a graphic design person that's created it, um, if you've got a friend, auntie, uncle, friend, you know, cousin, whatever, um, make sure that they've assigned the copyright over to you. Because otherwise, they own the copyright. If someone creates a website for you, make sure that you get the copyright over there. I've had a number of people that have come to me and said, oh, I have this website designer that's created my website. Now they are you know, charging me $50,000 to, uh, to get my website in my control so I can have the IP so that I can use it however I want. But they've been, they've been caught. And you know, they didn't think about getting that IP, created, uh, IP protected um, and, and an agreement in place to have that um, copyright uh, transferred over. Now, what, we, what I usually do to make it you know, crystal clear is do a copyright deed of assignment. Um, and the copyright deed of assignment goes, right, well, we created it, but we're assigning the ownership over to the third party. So that's really important because, uh, as I said, everyone has a logo um, predominantly with their business, and you don't want someone else to own the, the, your IP and your logo. Trademarks. I've actually specialised in trademarks for, for you know, um, all the time uh, that I've been in uh, IP, and it's uh, it affects everyone. I think there was some statistic that was like 1,500 trademarks that you see on a daily basis. Um, a, a trademark is a sign that distinguishes the goods and services of one trader from those of, the, of another. It can be in a word, a phrase, a letter, number, logo, picture, aspect of packaging, scent or smell. In fact, um, I worked in IP in New York for three years, um, where they think about IP first. Um, one of the mentors that I had while I was working in New York was um, told me last year that she um, helped register the Play-Doh scent. <laughs> so now that you can't, you cannot replicate the Play-Doh scent in the US. <laughs> um, a trademark is registered for 10 years, um, and then it must be renewed for every 10 years after that. Um, there's uh, 45 classes of goods and services. So um, if I am you know, uh, XYZ and I sell sewing machines, then someone else can be XYZ and be, you know, I don't know, in petrol, for example. Um, we both can be in, you know, as long as we're in different um, trade channels. So you sort of, you, you work out what you, you, know, you do and um, what my job is for clients is to do the broadest of protection for the client. Um, and it might be in a number of classes. You might not just fall into one category. You might, might going back to the coaching um, business. Um, you might fall in, a, you know, you might fall in uh, software. You might fall in training materials. You know, a service of um, coaching and mentoring. Again, I want I want a dollar for everyone who said, Michelle, I own a business name. I don't need to file a trademark. <laughs> well, that's not the case. Um, a business name is a regulatory tool and it um, doesn't help you in the trademark world unless you use it as a trademark or register it as a trademark. Now, what do I mean by using it? Um, putting it on your website, putting it on your clothes, on the side of your trucks and cars. Um, so don't think because you've got a business name that you own the trademark, so always um, look into that. What we normally do is what, when you create a brand, and again, I work with a lot of startups, so um, I appreciate, again, getting them at the startup stage because I can guide them in the right direction. Um, first off, I say the best trademark is one that's distinctive rather than descriptive. Now, we all want to describe our business. We want to tell the world what we do. That's fantastic. Um, but it's not great when you want to take action against third parties. Um, 
because if you arguably, if you use a generic term, um, that that generic term, you know, that, you know just say you know, Pete's plumbing. Well, someone else is called Pete's can also file a trade, you know, use that Pete's plumbing because arguably it's his name and they offer plumbing services. Um, so I recommend that you do, you know, come up with something distinctive. Now, I use this as an extreme, but Xerox for printing or Apple for computing. Now, Apple, look, they've got mar marketing budget, I understand that, but they told the world that, you know, Apples now relate to computers. So um, that was, but if someone else uses an Apple or something looks like an apple in relation to computers, then we know that the, the, they're copying. So that's why, you know, Xerox has created a term. Um, you know, we all know it now, but, um, you know, again, if someone uses something that's close to Xerox, we know that they're copying the brand. So what we do for um, a business is that you, um, we do a trademark availability search. And what we do there is we, it takes, takes me seven to ten days, but it allows us to see whether your name's available to use in the marketplace and to register. Now, some people do use the, the trademark in the marketplace and they don't register it. I, I advise against that, but that's what happens, especially with social media. There's social media accounts that just pop up and just go, right, I'm creating my brand and here it is on Instagram. Fantastic, but you might be stepping on other um, people's toes with that. So we um, recommend a trademark availability search um, before you even start, just to know where you're at, where you stand in the marketplace, because the last thing you want to do, it's so disruptive for your business, is to get a letter of demand and you have to stop using that name. Again, um, working in the States, they printed off by the second. Um, here, you know, I get one for a client that's, you know, once twice a week. Now, again, working with startups, I like to get you at this stage so I can change, you know, the way you, you set up your brand. But in, when I first started out on IP, um, the uh, people came to me when they had a problem, not the sort of preventative solutions. So we, we do the trademark availability search, and then we file a trademark application, which has a registration process. And it, we, again, the filing date is the most important, and then we file it, and then it goes through the registration process, and then gets registered after at least six to nine months um, if there's no problems. Now, just quickly, I just want, you know, someone yell out one of those brands and tell me what they do and what their price point is. Can someone yell out a brand for me? Disney. Sorry? Disney. Disney? What do they do? Entertainment. Entertainment. And, and their products are X, Y, and Z. You know, you've got a movie that's, you know, $5, whatever. But you have to tell me what that brand was. So I'm just giving an example, the power of a brand. All of you have a brand. You have to protect it. That if that's one message I can get you to take away from today, please protect your brand because it's worth it. And it's an intangible asset on the books so that um, a client recently sold their business and their main asset was the IP. So the power of a brand, you were able to see that logo and you're able to say, right, this is what they do, this is what they sell, this is the price point. I've had a bad experience with them, but that's okay. Um, and it, it just allows people to recognise you in the marketplace, but that's something you need to protect something it needs is a solid foundation for your business. I've got two minutes left, so I've gone to my... Um, so these are, the, um, these are the most valuable brands in the world at the moment, um, but that's just an example. Don't think you can't get that to that point. I, I always say, as I said before, think big and, you know, you never know, but the, please think about registering your IP at this, at this point. I know legal's a pain in the backside, I get it. Um, sometimes your budget doesn't allow that, but I say don't bury your head in the sand. Please do due, due diligence, do your searching and make sure that you know what's out in the marketplace before you even begin. Or if you are in business, even for two to three years, um, it's worthwhile just seeing what's happening out there already. So moving forward, you need to identify your IP by searching, making sure that no one else has your idea already out there or your name, um, really, really important. Then take steps to register it. Registering or, you know, give, for example, in the trademark world, it gives you um, registration Australia-wide from the get-go once you get that registration, which is great. And then protect. Make sure you're vigilant in the marketplace. Make sure you go to trade shows. Make sure you look at Google. Do Google searches for your name every six months. Um, it's really important because, as I said, with, you know, the socials and things, people start up the business and the client goes, oh, they've started up something on Instagram. I need to stop them. Well, you need to have 
you know, that knowledge because if you, you know, more people start using your brand without you knowing it, they'll get the right to it and become sort of a generic term. So, um, it, yeah, that's my three points to, to take home as well. Identify, register and protect. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one question, I reckon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, thank hey. you. Um, I've registered my trademark and I'm confused because I've put, I'm not sure if I'm meant to put the R above the logo or the TM because, well, I don't know. Okay, that's a great question. Um, TM, um, even if you haven't registered your trademark as yet, put TM next to it. It's telling the world that you have a trademark and that you're using it as a trademark. Um, it could also mean that you're in the application process through, um, to, that you've actually applied to file the trademark. So TM, any time. Um, R in a circle is only when you have a registered trademark. You've got that lovely certificate in your hand and you own the trademark so that you've got the number and the certificate. That's when if, it's actually an offence if you put an R in a circle um, next to your trademark and it hasn't been registered through the government department, then it's an offence. So, yeah. So put TM everywhere if you haven't... Um, you put the R in the circle, yeah. Amazing. All right. That's it. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. It's always so nice to hear someone so passionate about what they do and very knowledgeable. <laughs> it's really good. Um, okay, so just a little change to the schedule. Um, we have Patricia joining us online about the superpowers of neurodiverse employees and followed by, and, oh, sorry, and up in the Linden room, we've got Beck McFarland with Humanising Your Brand and Building a Community of Raving Fans. So if you want to go to that, run quickly. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have Anil Puri planning your business for success, and then Leanne Shelton back all in the ballroom. Alrighty, so Patricia online, is she, do we have her? Yes, we do, do you have me? We do, hello. Awesome, how welcome, are you? Welcome, good, how are you? Thank you, Stunning. I'm good, thank you. I'm gonna let you take the virtual floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you for being here and uh, watching my presentation. Um, so I'm coming to you uh, from Canberra, um, and um, I'm part of the Women with Altitude chapter in Canberra. So my name is Patricia Falchetta, and my business is Social Living Solutions. I work with neurodivergent people to help them navigate the landscape of neurodiversity. Over the past six years, I've created the Family Joy Program, which several neurodiverse families have successfully completed. I've been interviewed several times on radio nationally, and I've presented at conferences both nationally and overseas. And I'm currently completing a graduate diploma in counselling to further uh, help my clients and also obviously to further my knowledge. Typically, I work with children through to young adults who are struggling to fit into our current world. I help them gain clarity, self-love, control in their lives and feel confident in the journey they are on. So this first slide is me. So um, as you can see, I'm an autism advocate, facilitator, keynote speaker, author, neurodiversity expert, family joy expert, which is from the program that I've written and also a workplace facilitator. So today you're going to um, hear me um, use words such as um, neurodiverse, um, neurodivergent, um, and, and words like that. So I've got here my first um, slide for you is um, what is a neurodivergent brain? So my quote here says, let's start recognizing neurodiversity. Just as no two individuals are the same, neither are brains. Neurodiversity is just a different wiring that is individuals' strengths, talents, or gifts that are unconventional and that, sorry, that are unconventional and therefore we have great innovation and invention. So I just want to just, um, just stop here for a minute and just get you just, just thinking about something while I'm, while I'm talking today. So neurodiverse is actually all of us, okay? So whether we're neurotypical, so neurotypical is the general population or neurodivergent, which is people that have um, conditions such as autism, ADHD, and there are other conditions that often sit with autism and ADHD, which is a terrible word for comorbid conditions, and there are conditions such as anxiety, depression, 
um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia, they are neurodivergent. So people who have like these, and I really dislike using the word conditions because what it is is they have neurodivergent brains. So they're neurodivergent. The whole population is neurodiverse. So what I'm wanting um, to create awareness for you, all of you today, is within our networking environments and our business environments and what to look for to notice uh, if people um, have a neurodivergent brain and might be struggling in the networking context or might be struggling in the work context. So this is my vision and this is the, um, the principle, my, my biggest driver. So my vision is for a world with all people with autism and other neurodiversity are accepted, integrated and respected as valuable members of society, no matter what their ability. There are reasons why this is my vision. First of all, I'm neurodivergent myself, so I have ADHD. Um, and I've struggled uh, really throughout my life, probably until um, about two years ago when I was diagnosed with ADHD. But there are other reasons why this is my vision as well, um, is, is because the average life expectancy for a person with autism in Australia is 54 years of age. And that is because the high levels of anxiety and stress that they're always operating under, their unemployment rate is higher than that of the national unemployment rate and they typically suffer from mental health conditions anxiety and depression therefore this again is why their life expectancy rate is shorter because they often have high levels of cortisol in their systems and we all know that cortisol uh, shortens our lives one in 54 australians identifies having autism and one in 20 as having adhd so how might a neurodiverse person present, either in business or in our networking circles. So just, just, and just think about this a little bit, like, you know, in a networking room where we're networking with people, um, or if, um, again, in a business sense, if you, you know, own a shop, have a shop front, or you, um, you know, have, have an office place where there are people that um, could be neurodiverse and might not be, uh, and you might not know, because people still don't often um, let you know that they have a diagnosis. They might not know that they're neuro, neurodivergent, um, but or also they just might not be comfortable telling you, or it could be that for the first time in your office place or at a networking event. Often they'll, uh, you'll notice minimal eye contact, which is a typical one that we all know of. Um, so extreme nerves. So you might notice um, that somebody could be shaking. They could have a hand tremor. Uh, they could be fiddling with their hair. They could be doing something to try and regulate their body. But you, um, but it just looks like, like sort of like an odd, um, you know, uh, th thing that they're doing. You kind of don't know why. They might be appear to be disinterested in what is being spoken about. But this is because people who are neurodiverse have often have a delayed response in, um, a, in a, when you're speaking to them or talking to them. And the reason why they have a delayed response is they often have difficulty processing information. So if you think at a networking event, like if you look at the room that you're sitting in now, which I can see on my screen, you look at the lighting, you look at the screen, right? You look, there's people around, there are people wearing um, strong perfumes. There, there uh, could be there could be people writing. There could be people clicking pens, things like that. So their brain is trying to focus on all of that stuff that's going on around them in that room with you, and then they're trying to focus on me speaking. So imagine if you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with someone in that room and you don't know they're neurodivergent. That could be why it it um, there's they have an it, they appear to be slow in responding back to you because they're trying to process all of that, focus on you and come and come back to you and give you the response. So the brain is trying to uh, cope with a lot of different things. They often will have low self-esteem and low confidence, uh, which is which is why it sometimes is so hard for them to come to, to networking to networking events. Again, they might be fidgeting or have difficulty sitting still, and that will be because they're trying to regulate their nervous system um, and, and keep their nervous system um, 
calm. So there's um, something that we call stimming that people who are neurodiverse do. Like I often will shake my leg. It can be really annoying if someone's sitting next to me. Other people might play with their hair. As I mentioned before, they might hold something in their hand. But there's their way and, and, and rub on it because they're trying to regulate the nervous system. The delayed responses that um, I was talking about earlier um, and also um, they're, uh, sorry, but they're, they're they, um, sorry, they're, oh, sorry, and also they're, um, de sorry, delayed responses. Um, so they're the things that ways that it might present in business. But the other way that it might present in business is the, the positives that you see here. So they loyal friends and employees. Okay, so they have fantastic attention to detail. So when you're employing, if you're employing someone um, and, and you know that they're neurodiverse, this is, this is a real asset to your organization. If you give them tasks like data entry or even uh, looking at specifics in a room and things like that, they will have fantastic attention to detail and be able to pick up on things that you might not pick up on. They have the ability to stick to the letter. So they follow instructions to the T. So they will take it. It's, it is true that they often are very black and white, and um, and uh, you know, and being black and white means that they will follow instructions. So if you give them specific tasks to do, very very uh, likely to have error. Super efficient around the office. Other strength is they they come at problems from a completely different angle, an angle that you won't often think of because. Their brains think differently and they possess that ability to think outside the box and outside the square. And the other huge plus is that they don't lie. So they won't take a sick day unless they are truly unwell, which is um, like just, it's, which is an amazing, that's an incredible asset when you've got an employee and you're, um, you know, dependent on them being there every day, that that is a fantastic asset. So my, the, the um, points behind this slide is I have got the, um, you know, the negatives there that we might look at um, and that we might think of, like the, that we might think that they're disinterested or they're not responding very quickly or they're fidgeting. But then I've also got all of the positives and all of the strengths that come with either interacting, networking, collaborating, or having a neurodiverse person uh, work for you in your business. So, um, oh, my screen's just gone funny. Just hang on. So, what I'm wanting to give you now is potential triggers uh, to sensory overload. So these are, are triggers to be aware of in your networking environment. So when you're choosing venues to hold networking events and also in your office environment as well. So they, um, the first one here is um, too fast. And I'll talk about these um, in a second. Second one is too bright and then too loud, too tight. So this is what I'm, what the point of this slide is to just get you to think about the environment. So for example, um, like, you know, uh, uh, I, I, there was a networking group here in Canberra that I used to be part of and I used to run. And one of the initial environments that we held out these events in, and this was because we couldn't find a better venue, was um, basically like a nook in a club and near that nook, there was a children's playroom and um, very close by pokey machines. Now, for somebody that's neurodiverse, that, that, is, that is an absolute nightmare, okay, because they won't be able to focus on what's going on or what's happening because of the noise from the, the pokey machines or maybe the children uh, playing in, you know, in the, um, sorry, in the, in the children's room. Then also the too fast, the point around that is when you're giving them instructions or when you're talking to them to slow down and also to make sure, um, you know, just to check in and make sure that they're understanding what you're saying to them. In the workplace, it can often be very advantageous to give them a list to follow and explicit instructions to go through uh, because often when you give them verbal instructions, they will only remember the first thing you said and not the last thing you said. And the too bright thing is, again, it's referring to the lights, um, the lighting that's around um, in an office place, they might not be, want to be set next to a window. In an office place, they might not want to be set under a, um, a, a fluorescent light or a bright light. 
The other things to be aware of in the office place are also um, some of them because they have these, these sensory issues. So this is sensory overload. Um, uh, the other things that contribute to, can contribute to that are sometimes people wearing really strong perfumes can be, um, I mean, even those of, you know, those of you that aren't neurodivergent will sometimes find strong perfumes too much. Foods that people are eating in the workplace, um, you know, such as like example that comes to my mind straight away is something like a tuna sandwich or an egg sandwich that has a really strong smell and also um, noise in the workplace too. So they might prefer to wear headphones when they're working. Now they're not wearing headphones because they're being rude. They're wearing headphones to try and cut out the noise that's around them and maybe listen to music that relaxes them and helps them to engage uh, better with you in the workplace because that music keeps them calm. So then when you come to them, of course, they'll take out their headphones to speak to you. They're, they're, they're calm and they're regulated and they're able to respond to you quickly. So they're, they're the reasons why, um, you know, they're, they're just the, the issues to, to be aware of. Now I've got here sensory overload. Some of you will have heard of autis autistic meltdowns. Autistic meltdowns are a real extreme. And what they are is when these triggers or sensory overload that too much has happened to that person in a day and then they have a meltdown. Now what, what will typically happen in the workplace is they won't have that meltdown in the workplace but there could be things in their work environment that they're having difficulty coping with and that are causing them to overload. And then when they go home at night or in the afternoon, they're virtually in bed under the covers trying to regulate themselves to be able to come back to work the next day. So their houses might typically look very dirty. They might eat a lot of takeaway and things like that because they're actually then don't have the capacity to go home and cook themselves a meal because they're just in so much overload. So um, I love this saying um, that inclusivity only makes for winners. Um, so sometimes bonding with others who are experiencing the same challenges with neuro neurodiversity that you are brings realization that others are on the same journey. If we all bond to support one another, then we will all find tremendous peace, joy, and positivity as we share mutual experiences and journeys and see all the different paths to get to the same destination. So what I'm saying to you here with this quote is that we all experience the same challenges, whether we're neurodivergent or not. So we want to support everybody in our networking environments, in our office places, uh, in our work environments to reach their full potential. So we want to focus on the similar, what is similar between us, but we also want to understand those differences. There are no losers when we support and accommodate neurodiverse members of our networks and businesses. So what can we do? What can you do uh, to make this easier for, uh, for neurodivergent people? So learn more about neurodiversity. Um, I've got a, a website here that, um, that's just listed here under this um, point here on the slide. So try and learn more about neuro neurodiversity because as I said before, understanding is the first step to breaking down the barriers. Be conscious of the environment for meetings and events. Communicate in a clear and concise manner. So remember what I said about that thing with less um, you know, uh, something that I've suggested before for networking events is that we send people out um, an, an email, like a, an email before the event where it actually has the structure of what's going to happen in the event to take place because people who are neurodivergent, that really helps them to plan and to have that routine and know what's going to happen at the event. And also to focus on the strengths of the individual. So how to harness their strengths. So this, um, the www.mindsetandhearts.net is a really, really good website to hop on to. It's got a lot of information on it. And learning more allows us to understand and understanding reduces discrimination and discomfort. And it also allows us and you to be a friend to someone else who might be in a challenging situation and might really, really appreciate that support and the fact that you have that knowledge and that, you're, that you understand uh, what having a neurodivergent brain is like and how difficult it can be 
uh, for neurodivergent people to um, attend networking events or how that the workplace might be difficult, but there are these really, really small changes that we can make to make the workplace easier for them, you know, that aren't huge. Like if somebody's wearing a strong perfume, well, you know, the days that that person's working, they don't wear the perfume that day. Or if there's, they found the, find the music in, like if they're in a shop or something and it's too loud and too distracting, that we maybe look at that music and, and something else that, that might be uh, better for them so that they can really focus on the customer when the customer comes in. So I'll just give you a little um, uh, information on um, uh, what's happening uh, for me in the near future. So um, over here on the right, I've got a, um, it's a free um, family joy masterclass. There are three sessions. The first one, oh, actually this date is wrong, sorry. I've changed the dates. So the first one's on the 16th of March, then the second one, the 23rd, and then the third one on 30th. They're from 7.30 to 9 at night. They're going to be live on Zoom. So anybody anywhere can uh, join on 7.30 to 9 um, Australian Eastern Standard Time. And what they're about, they're actually, I've created this program with um, somebody who um, is also an expert in working with families. And what it's our direct response to COVID. So it's actually to help you guys, all of us to get out of the overwhelm and sense of hopelessness that we're all feeling under COVID, uh, after COVID and help you in your family's deepen connections, change disruptive habits and find their path to resilient joy. You'll be getting um, a workbook and a resource with that. And as I said, it, it, um, they're free. They're going to be really, really fantastic workshops. Um, so if you want, just reach out to me um, on my next slide. I've got my socials and everything. And then the other thing is um, leading on the spectrum workshops. So we're going to be running one here in Canberra in mid-2022. We also run them by request, but you can also contact me to run sessions for you or at your networking event if you like. So they're inter interactive workshops that provide managers with leadership skills and strategies for bringing out the best in their team members, but also can be tailored for networking events. And here are the different ways that you can connect um, and contact me. Uh, this is, and down here below is also um, my resource that I've created that goes with my Family Joy program. Um, you can purchase that if you like uh, from me. That's $100 plus postage. Um, and that accompanies my 10-week Family Joy program. But this is also if you're interested in having a look at the program and want to um, do it DIY. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, um, all the way from Canberra as well. Mm -hmm. Stunning presentation. What are you doing the rest of today then? <laughs> all done. <laughs> um, I'm actually, we're actually going to um, the Brumbies again, or, um, the Brumbies, which is our rugby union team, for those of you that don't know union. No idea. Uh, we're going to watch them play uh, Fiji this afternoon because my dad's from Fiji, so that's what we're doing later oh. on today. Stunning. <laughs> Well, Thank we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you for dialing into the conference today. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.